Hi everyone, and welcome to the video with uh, with me and Ivan von Zalen. And um, and I, um, I, um, I need to read your bio and write um, write up something that I can say official um, about about you. But Ivan, um, Ivan's one of the most impressive um, people that I know, and super smart, and um, and knows um, knows a lot about cluttering, and has already. And uh, this is the second video, and the first video already taught me a whole bunch of stuff about myself. So um, so this is just really really cool that she is. Um, um, she is volunteering to do this because it's it's just very very um, helpful. So so this um, this video is going to talk um, be, be centered around the um, the experience of school aged children, and we'll talk about a lot of stuff related to that. So is, is that a good introduction, Yvonne? Uh, yes, perfect. Well, and I think um, maybe you can give me ten more seconds to give you a compliment for what you do because I think it's very important um, that you make all these videos and connections between people with cluttering or clutterers or how they want to be called. Mm -hmm. I don't mind, but to share knowledge and, and to be connected. I think that's wonderful, Joseph. Thanks for that. Um, thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. So last video we, we ended um, and I said, I need something to, to share about the uh, rate and rate development. So um, I sent you the, the video with, with the graph. With, can, you, can you show us the that? And, uh, and that, one's the one from your, uh, that one's the one from your book, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and this is a, this is an important thing to realize and I'm always a little bit surprised that not all speech language pathologists um, are aware of this, but what, what this uh, figure tells us that the rate of speech in people, in, in people around the world is increasing with age until the age of 22, 23, and then it goes down again. So. What we see is that in the age group of six to four and, and 10 uh, to eight. And this, is, uh, this is for everyone, not, not just people. This with is cluttering. for everyone. This is completely for everyone. Um, so it is like normal to have like four and a half syllables per second um, in the younger age. So let's say make it easy to below 11. And after 11 years of age, due to um, hormonal changes, a huge increase in rate is happening in everyone. And if you quantify it, it's 25%. So it doesn't happen by night. It is a process, of course. It's not like one day you do this, one day do you do that. But what it means is that adolescency is highly correlated to rate increasement. So that means that children age 11, age 12, at that time, their rate that was maybe already fast is increasing to a level that makes them completely difficult to be understood. And they, they can experience trouble around the age of 10, 11 for the first time, although they were fast before. So some children who clutter are very fast when they're very young, but they're still able to cope with it. But when the rate increases even more around the age of 11 or older, then they're not capable of dealing with that rate anymore. And then you hear their disfluencies or then you hear them being unintelligible. And what is very important is that the top of rate is in the ages of 16, 17 years of age. And after that, it goes down. And at the age of around 2023, 20, we see that it is a little bit lower than the, than the rate level that we had at the age of 11. So why do people um, who are called stutterers or clutterers um, have this natural um, recovery? One of the the most important things is because 
there is a natural decrease in rate after the age of 16, 17 until 23. Then the brain is all said and done and then there are no, not that more changes anymore. And then again, later in life, there's also a degree, the decrease around the age of 50. And again, it's related to hormonal changes. And, um, and, so and you mentioned- You can take it away now, and then we, I can see you again. Okay. Um, so so a, question, um, a question that I have is um, why, why, why with um, why with people do does the rate slow down around like twenty two or twenty three? Um, you said hormonal changes, but yeah, um, yeah. but I um, I don't really remember thinking of, or like seeing a twenty three year old and saying oh they um, they speak slower than a um, than a twenty year old. Well, I said it is a it, it's a gradual process. Well, it's not. One day, if we have fast speakers, we have slow speakers, but everyone goes through the same development. That's, that's the first thing. Second thing is why is there something happening around 21, 23 at that age? That is the end of the adolescence per period. That me, in the adolescence period, a lot is happening in the brain, complete reorganization, complete displacement of functions in the brain. It's, it goes too far to explain that now, but there's a lot going on. And then when that is settled, then we see that there, there is a rest in hormonal um, balance and then also the rate is, is lower. And that is, that is something that we know is happening. And remember rate is organized in the brain. It's not a decision, it's organized in the brain. It's highly related to the functioning of the basal ganglia, also an important part of the brain. And um, it is also related very much, therefore, to emotions. And if you are an adolescent, I don't know if you remember it, but your emotions go, through, go all the way and up to the ceiling. And, and also, also that is more at ease after the age of 22. 23. So it's the whole process. What is the most important for us now is that many children who maybe were not completely fluent or were maybe had a little bit of speech issues can start to become special around the age of 10, 11. In my clinic, I saw many children that Parents did not understand what happened to my child. He was so good in speech. And now suddenly something is completely wrong. And one of the most asked and earliest questions I always ask these children, and don't blame me for it, but I ask them, do you have hair in funny places? And the children said, yeah. That means that when you have hair in funny places, it's a different way of asking, did your adolescency start? Is there, a, is there a change in hormone setting? And many of the children that start around 10, 11 and can be diagnosed or can be labeled as now they are in a little bit in trouble or they're very much in trouble, it is related to the change to adolescency and to hormones. Okay, and and that's uh, that's really interesting. I um, I have kind of another question. I don't know if this is related or um, or or not. But do clutters uh, um, pe people with cluttering is there um, does the rate typically follow that same? Um, yes. Yes, but they the, they start higher, so the top is higher, and the down is also higher. Okay. Yeah, but the, it's the same development. There's no change there. No, no. So, okay. um, one of the things that I that I said to um, to to the colleagues who also work with with stuttering people is never ever stop therapy at the age of eight or nine, because we know that later, a couple of years later in life 
you have the increase of re rate and you don't know what will come at that age. Yeah, so the, it is a very difficult time. And you have, we have to think that age 11 is the age the children based on their social emotional development tend to do less with mom and daddy and more alone. So it can happen that for a, for a while, no one is even noticing it. Sometimes they go to different schools so they don't have one teacher but 24 teachers. So they are unnoticed. So they do experience communica communicative problems and no one is, is really noticing it for a while and they can feel very very much alone in that and that is that is that is hurtful if you hear if you talk to these kids and they think they're the only one in the world that that this happened to uh, and that's um yeah that's really interesting because um that's uh, that's something that um that i i don't remember uh, well, well, at the at the time, I wasn't really very aware of my speech, but I um, I remember feeling just very alone. Like um, it it seems like I'm the only one. It seems like I'm the only one like this, and um, and I don't know anyone else like this. But but maybe maybe everyone else is like this. But um, well, if you have if you do something and there's and you're one out of hundred doing that, you need one hundred at least more than 100 friends to find another person who does the same thing. So that's quite, <laughs> it's quite rare to have more than 100 friends if you're 10 years of age. So that is why it's important to have communities or to make uh, uh, people meet with others or can be children and adults who meet each other just to, to show this is the same issue. You know, we're the same. You're not, well, you're special as a person, but not special because of the way you speak. And there is, there is one good thing in, about this, this development, and we should not forget it. I always tell my clients that if it is possible to, to, to guide you through these 16, 17 years of age without negative thoughts about yourself, without negative feelings about your own communication, then the only way is up because then your rate will go down and you will get more control, more control and you will feel way better. And that is, that is something that we can also realize. So don't tell that to 11 year old because then 16 is, is far away. But if a child is 13, 14, you can say, okay, you, you have gone through the most of it and now we're almost there to go where you, where you are helped by nature to make it even better. And the, the school age is very, very difficult for children with cluttering or clutterers, um, because you like the word clutterers, I will try to use that term. Um, uh, why is it so difficult? Well, they speak fast, they act fast, they think fast, they do fast, they digest fast, everything is fast. It's not that one thing is fast, in many cases, everything is fast. So for instance, they write fast, they, they write things down fast. If you write very fast as a child, there's a lot to say about your handwriting. And last time we talked about the phonological cluttering, the, the unintelligible cluttering, if you listen to it and you think, what did you say? Well, that happens in handwriting too. So they write so fast, it is, it is very difficult for others to read. And what the teachers tend to do is to say, you should better focus on your handwriting. But this handwriting goes by itself. So if they need to write with the bigger letters, that will take so much focus away um, that it could take their focus away from what they are actually writing or how they are writing it related to spelling. And I'm, I know that you're not a phonological clutterer mostly, but the other one, the syntactical cluttering where you have all these disfluencies, 
So I can kiss the way that you wrote as a little child, but maybe you can even, you can better tell me. And um, yeah, I, I actually don't, um, don't remember very much. I think, I think though, uh, well, I think I, I think I mentioned once that I, uh, like in, in my journal, then I um, had like so many crossed off words. Like, like I think one page in my journal, I had, um, I had about half of the words that I crossed that I crossed off. Um, sometimes, sometimes I think because of spelling mistakes. Sometimes because, um, sometimes because of just, um, I think I, I think amazing um, go, um, going in one direction, realizing oh, that's not actually the, uh, that's not actually the way that I want the sentence to. Um, to go. So, so in essence, what you do is you write down before the formulation is finished. So you're writing down, then you realize this is not the right, correct sentence, and then you start all over again, like it is with the disfluencies. And mm -hmm. that is typical for children with syntactical cluttering. And you see a lot of this, I don't know the word, uh, the English word for it, but there's a lot of this false starts in the writing. So there are words on the paper, but not the correct one. And um, um, normal letter size, while in the phonological clutters, you see that the letter size is also very small. And what I always ask people, if they do an assessment, che check what happens if you take away language formulation from the writing. So ask them to copy a text and look at what happens there. If you copy a text and you have, um, again, this normal handwriting, okay, perfect. If you have the small handwriting that tells you a lot about what is happening in the brain, because writing is another output of the same speech language system. It's only Right, written instead of spoken language. So look at it and try to understand what is happening there. Instead of telling the child, focus, do your best, you should perform better because that is, that is not fair to these kids. So, so what, is, um, what does that tell if, the, if, if, if someone copies text and it drastically improves, what does that tell? And then, if some, if someone copies text and it's pretty much exactly the same, what does what does that also tell? Well, if you copy the text, what you took away, then you took away the language formulation. So, in essence, you're only ask, you're only looking at the handwriting itself. Is did the child learn that they had to do it in this way, like you did all the exercises when you were little? If you copy the text and it's still very small. So we took the language away, but it is still very small. Then you see that that handwriting is related to fast rate and not to anything else. So it is impossible that for them to slow down. And ha the handwriting itself is a development that goes until up to the age of 11, 12. And all this bullying on handwriting with young children um, with cluttering by the teachers, do your best, do your best. It is so um, negative for them. And, and if you give a little bit more time, a couple of years more time for handwriting development, you see that in the end, they will develop a reasonable, readable handwriting themselves. And if if that gives trouble, then we have to ask the teacher if this child maybe could work on a laptop instead of work with a written pen to make sure that the, what is uh, meant is also read by the teacher. If the teacher can't read your stuff, then you're in trouble. So then you can also work with a laptop. Um, to, to make it a little bit more natural, I will tell you um, about Anushka, my daughter. Um, she was 13, 13 years of age. She came home and there was a cry. There was these tears in her eyes. And I thought, what happened? And she said, mommy, I wrote something down last week. 
and this week I can still read it. <laughs> and you know, you can be smart and you can be a very good therapist at all, but I was speechless. Like, what? That was the first time that she was able to read her own handwriting one week later. And she tried for years, for years, for years. And she's not the only one. There are a lot of children punished for not doing good. Um, so in Holland, we knew, now have a tendency that if you do have an issue here, you can work with the laptop. There is, There are some issues there for reading, but most of the children, if you have um, started your reading development, working on a laptop is, is not a problem. Yeah, and, and I remember I remember saying once that my handwriting isn't actually a record of, of what, um, what's being said. It's more just a loose guide for me to remember what was going on. <laughs> um, so, so that's um, that's really uh, that's really interesting, and and, and I have a uh, I have a question. Uh, the answer is probably just for the teacher to um, re relax, but but I think there's probably a lot of well-meaning teachers. They see um, th uh, they see messy handwriting, and they think, oh, hey, well, it's my job to it's my job to shape and mold this kid. Um, is is there anything constructive they can um, they can say to get the handwriting better, or do the teacher does the teacher just need to uh, relax and wait a few years? Well, I think it's it's really important to to do an assessment of the handwriting, and this also means um, how you hold your pen. So, so many children who write too fast, they tend to write neater. But then in order to do that, they, they push their fingers. They, they do like this. So they, they write for 10 minutes and it's like, they have a sore hand. So um, look first how it is created and ask for copying, ask for prepared writing and try to find out what is going wrong here. Is it, is it a rate? Uh, is it a problem with the inhibition, so that's the motor again, or has it to do with not being focused or something else? And only go for the thing that you for sure know that will make the difference. But okay. only and, asking, um, do your best, is that is that's not working. And and that's um, that's really um, that's uh, that's really good. That's really good advice. That instead of jumping in and uh, instead of jumping in and just trying to correct immediately. Then spend a lot of time um, spend a lot of time before doing diagnostic work, um, so so that so then you're you're sure. Hey, well, this um, this is the part that um, that could help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So question question why instead of ah, I know uh, how to deal with it. Uh, th there is another thing with reading. I, I used the word reading. I realized it, and and, and yes, we need to talk about reading as well. Um, is there a problem in reading in clutterers? No. Is there a problem in understanding a clutter, clutterer's reading? Yes. Sometimes it goes so fast we can't follow them. We don't. We can't process it. And um, what is what is a problem? Why is that a problem? If you have to do a reading test in the classroom, and you read too fast what will happen is that you will read all the, let's say, difficult words. They are relatively okay because there's enough focus, but all the small words are with mistakes and, um, or just guessed, we call that guest reading. And in, in many cases that I saw, I, I, I noticed that children got diagnosed by calling them dyslectic because they made so many mistakes in reading. Um, then what I, um, I, I wanted to find out how can we um, differentiate the dyslectic reading from the fast reading because of cluttering. And then we found out that heightened auditory feedback makes a difference. It's like, you, you, it's like a miracle. What do I mean? 
you ask a child to read out loud and you give him a microphone uh, or ear earphones or whatever. So if you speak, you hear yourself talk and the reading mistakes in cluttering disappear as a miracle. That does not happen in children with dyslexia. Their, their issues will not change if you only give them heightened auditory feedback. And if you take away the heightened auditory feedback, in cluttering, the errors come back by itself. You don't have to ask for them, they're back. That has everything to do with if I hear myself speak, I will inhibit myself. I will go a little bit slower. That's what I will try because I hear that I'm making mistakes. But if I don't hear myself, I just keep going. And then it, it, it becomes a problem and you make too many mistakes in the text. Um, what is a problem here is that... And, and so... Um... Why why does heightened auditory feed why why does heightened auditory feedback work? Because um, you are more I, you are know, more aware of what that. you're actually doing. And and heightened feedback could also be visual feedback. If you do something and you get visual feedback, you will perform better. That's why the dancers are in front of a mirror practicing because they get a little bit more feedback so they feel a little bit better how to raise their foot or or whatever and for speech it's the same if i hear myself talk in a better way and you can do it with the uh, whisper phone you can also do it like this if you do like can you do like this if you only do so this no no no, no easier so you do this and okay. then the ball of your hand in front of your mouth. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. That uh, that actually uh, works because um, you. That's uh, my uh, you, told me, uh, you told me this before, and I. Um, uh, uh, okay, so so show me um, show me again. So you put your four fingers behind your ear. Okay. And this one, you make a little bit round. Touch okay. your hand and go in front of your mouth. Okay, and. Um, actually, the okay, it's right, right, right here. So I can, um, I can hear that. Oh, okay, so that's that's really cool. I, um, I don't know if you can still hear me, but yeah, I can still hear you. And of course, it looks a little bit weird. So um, that the funny thing is, for instance, I have an iPhone here, and you have the um, um, what is it called? You have the mic and and talk uh, earphones for for the mm -hmm. iPhone. If you just put them in, then you will notice that your, your phone call is way better because you have heightened auditory feedback. You have them in plastic. We have like plumbers that make them for the children. They make these things just with plumbing materials. So you, you talk and you, it's an open plastic thing. There's nothing technological needed here. It's only you hear yourself talk. And by hearing yourself talk better, you give yourself feedback and you slow yourself down. That's, that's, the, that's so, the essence. Um, and so just uh, one, more, one more question related to that is uh, because um, I can hear my voice like through my head. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I think most people think that they're actually hearing their voice where, where they're not actually like hearing like the, the real voice. Um, but, but why? Um, why is just hearing my voice like through my head and not, not enough? Because uh, you're not enough focused on it. And if I do this for a little while, then you fo your focus on hearing yourself talk is increased. Normally, you, you don't hear yourself speak. You just speak, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, pay, if you focus, you try to better hear yourself speak but we cannot do that for the whole day. That would be exhausting. So if I talk about heightened auditory feedback, it's only to differentiate. It's only to test, it's only to learn, it's only to feel it, but it never ever 
something that you will have to do the rest of your life or throughout your day. But sometimes you, if you have a phone call, it can help you a lot because at least that phone call then is going way better or easier or better, better understandable than without the heightened auditory feedback. Yeah, so the, but the most important is that if children who clutter have issues with reading, try to find out if it's related to issues with reading or with the fact that they're too fast and they are not monitoring enough. And it's so easy to do that. It will only cost you 50 cents to get something like this from the plumber. It's, it's not difficult, but you have to do it. And you can also use the headphones, the bigger ones that the uh, people use that are building streets, the noise reduction headphones that are not meant to make, you, make yourself heard. Because if you do like this, you also hear yourself talk better, but then you hear it through your, to your uh, bone. Um, okay, so so um, let me uh, let me get this right. That if you if you use noise canceling headphones, then it will it, it'll make your voice sound different enough that it kind of forces you to focus on your voice. But again, it's for a certain period of time, just for a little while. It's not forever. It's not a miracle, but it's to find out what is what is happening here, and that is very important. And it's, uh, it could also be, if you do it, you make a recording for yourself with the hydrant auditory feedback. Sorry, it's like, it's like a habit to do like this. If you do it with hydrant auditory feedback, um, to record yourself and listen, is this the way I want, it, I want to, to, to talk? If that is the way, then it means that you can train yourself in, in improvement of your speech, because this is what you can do, but you're only not using it at this time yet. So that is also one of the issues here. Okay, well, there are other things that we have to consider. If you, if you are a fast thinker, what happens is that normally you tell about the solution first before you tell about the problem. So if, if you have like a timeline, you, you forget to tell this and you only tell me this. Yeah, so it's, it's like, what are we talking about? What did you just say? And so this, this, the, the fastness of thinking um, can give a lot of difficulties in communication because the other doesn't understand why you give a solution if they, if he didn't even think that there was a problem? Um, they don't understand about who you are talking because they missed the introduction of that person. So there's a there's a gap uh, missing, and that is because the brain goes so fast. Um, to to clarify it in school, um, I know a lot of clutterers and I'm not saying everyone there's no research to to back that up but I know a lot of clutterers who are very good in math so they see they see this um, exercise in math and what they did what do they do they write down the answer but that's not what a teacher wants them to do the teacher wants them to do right step one step two step three step four and then the answer but if your brain goes, it is very difficult to write down things that are not helping you. And what is even more a problem, if the teacher tells me, I give points for every step and you only get one point for the final answer, but the steps to get there are more important than the answer. Because if you don't need the steps, you get less points than, and, and sometimes they even say they cheat. I said, they don't cheat. Just put them in the classroom. Just make, make them do a test without any preparation and they will show you they don't need all the steps. It's boring. They don't like it. Do you get that one? Yeah, um, sorry, you mean, you mean, do I understand or did I, oh, yeah. did that happen? 
Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so that's uh, that's a really good example. Um, can can you also give an example of that, like in a in a speaking situation? Because I um, I'm I'm also a um, I'm I'm also someone that, that's good at math. Um, I graduated in math, uh, well, statistics, which is kind of kind of math, um, and 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 I've always really liked um, math. So um, so so that example um, that example. I didn't give it for you especially. This is. <laughs> No, no, this is not for you, especially. This is one of the things that I was confronted by a lot. But um, this is also something that happens if you ask a child to read a text and then you ask him questions. So what, they, what a clutterer does is like vroom. And then if you ask them detailed questions, they miss out, they, they can't do it. They may make mistakes. And, um, and that's because they don't read the tiny words, they're just too fast. And, but if you ask them to retell the essence of the whole paper, it's like perfect. So in, if, you, if you have tests, and in Holland we have a final exam in the end of school years at the age of 12, they have to read an assignment and give an answer. And based on that, they score points and their uh, future education is decided on it. So it's, it's a bigger deal. If you read an assignment that, that's too fast, your answer will be wrong. So what I ask them to do is if they have a task with um, written exercises, like if you look at the pictures, which one of the buses has two open doors and less people in it, something like that. Because they're so fast, they don't grab all the necessary information, they will score lower. So what I'll do, make them do is ask them if they could do the test, same test. Um, I sound like someone I don't want to talk about. <laughs> same test, I'm sounding a little bit like Trump here, I didn't want to do that. Um, now, but go to the same text, but do it in a heard version. So they have to listen to someone else reading out loud that question and then answer it. And, and we did that in, in a research project. And then you saw a big difference in the, in the children with cluttering um, that they performed way better in the heard version of this exam than in the reading version of the exam. So what it means for us, be aware. And if parents tell you as a teacher that the school results are below their expectations, don't immediately think that these are too proud uh, parents. Try to figure out that maybe it could be wrong maybe it could happen that these children underperform in classroom. And that underperforming in classroom is one of the most seen issues in all the clients I've seen with cluttering. Underperform because they are bored about the exercises that they have to do because they, they go so fast and then they, they, they want they want to be triggered with things, with difficult things, to find it out. And all this repetition and doing the same stuff all over again, it's not, it's not always um, in, their, uh, in their best interest. They got it already. So keep on going. So, um... So, so what, um, be, uh, because, because teachers can't really like totally change the curriculum or, or, or say, hey, well, um, all, the, all the folks with cluttering um, don't have to do all the steps and everyone else um, has to, um, everyone else gets points for the steps, but, uh, but only 10% for the, for the right answer. Um, what um, what are some uh, uh, what are some other things that um, that teachers can do, um, or, or 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 I guess it's more that uh, like like if a 
if if a parent if a parent says, "Hey, well, I know my kid's smart, um, but uh, but I watch I watched Yvonne's video and I realized that oh well, he's he's just he, um, he's just bored. His head his his head is going really really fast and and skipping a bunch of stuff. And um, what um, what um, what what can the what can the parent do in that situation? Um, and then also, um, is there anything the teacher can do in that situation too? Well, first of all. Um, a teacher doesn't have to change everything, but you can be blunt to teacher. Because every teacher tells me that his grading style does not fit my child and I have to deal with it, this person has an issue, at least with me. Because it is not, um, it, it, that's, that should not be the, the starting point of education. Secondly, I asked many of the children said uh, myself, what do you want to do in school to, to keep you more alert, to keep you more focused uh, in the classroom? And um, some of the kids, they asked me, can I do one, uh, one full form with exercises, just extra? The teacher doesn't have to correct it, but just, you know, can I do an extra page? You know, I like it. Um, some children do projects for the teacher or some people do, let's say, let's call it literature studies uh, to make sure that they find something else and present it in the, in the classroom. So they are triggered by some very easy to, to come up with things that make it a little bit more attractive for them to be in the classroom. But because they are finished with every task, re, re, think about it, every task they make, they are finished earlier than the other ones. So they have to wait for 10 minutes for the other ones to finish. And then the teacher tells you, well, you have to sit still. Don't be a burden. Don't do, th don't do this. This is not okay. You can also give, ask them, what do you want to do in that 10 minutes? And maybe it's reading Harry Potter. I don't mind what you do. Ask the child. And if the child can make their own decision, you will make sure that it fits in the classroom. You only have to explain it. He's a little bit faster than all of us, but we want him to keep quiet. So that's what he can do. And the children know what they want to do. And then um, I guess one of the things the parents could do is is facilitate that conversation, and then um, and then call the teacher and say, "Hey, hey, is it okay if is it is it okay if Billy does an um, um, like does his work really fast, and then does an extra worksheet, or here's a here's a workbook that I got that um, that he that he'll do extra um, since he um, is so is so fast with things. Uh, what um, what other things? Uh, what other things? Joseph, I ha I have to intervene here. Um, I, in my experience, even as a mom, I have experienced that as a mom, you, in many cases, you're not taken seriously. So if there's an issue in school, if I've learned something in my life, always take an expert with you who will tell the same story as the mom can do, but they believe the expert, they never believe the mom. Even when my child with cluttering had to me, was organized in a good way. And um, sorry, you were um, you were cutting out for me um, for just like the last thirty seconds. Can you? Okay, so I said even with my children having issues in school, I am for and I'm an expert in cluttering. So even in that situation, I asked my colleague. I gave her all the expert knowledge for, for that only <laughs> conversation. I took her to school and she was simply repeating what I was saying there and that helped. And, be, and otherwise I could not get through it. So it's, it has nothing to do with my communicative competencies, but it has to do with hierarchy or whatever. And this, this belief in teachers that parents always want more 
out of their children and we don't realize that that is not possible and if your child has last last june i spoke to a teacher and he thought that the uh, developmental level of this kid was like here and i proved him it was here and he was like shocked really i said okay I, i will show you i will ask him this question this question this question and then in the end he said oh my goodness i didn't realize that this was such a smart boy he was so focused on the negative behavior, just the not sitting still, the turning around, the, you know, the not doing his best, that he forgot that this kid was doing that because he was not triggered enough. He was not spoken to on the level he needed. And in I have never done research on this topic, but... In my experience, many of the people with cluttering have a very fast rate of thinking and a, and a high level of IQ. I saw many of them and I saw many people with cluttering with even very high levels of IQ. And that is, that is not typical for a, for a population where, without cluttering. So there is something going on because you think so fast, you have experience in thinking and, but there's a lot, lot under, to understand about it. And we do need to do re more research there, but it is, it is, in, it, is has, it has happened so many times that um, we have to, we have to help to teach you to realize that. And, and even if you would be in a conversation, you could do that online or you can ask a speech language pathologist to do that online, to be in the conversation. You can make a huge difference there. But don't ask for difficult things. An extra, yeah, a, an extra form, perfect. Cool. So, so what, um, what, other things could parents um, could parents do like like, like not uh, not at the school but just just at home um, their their child's been diagnosed with cluttering um, the um, the child's kind of struggling with the teacher um, what's um, what what are things the parents could do at home to to help um, the child with oh there's so much there's so much let me let me start with going to bed. What would we know about cluttering? That there's an inhibition issue. So the brain is thinking it goes fast, fast, fast. You put your child in bed and he will not sleep or she will not start to sleep. So what, pa what parents tend to do, they close the curtains, they uh, turn off the sound and everything is silent. And then they want the child to go to sleep. But at that time, the brain is still firing. It continues. So that it is in many cases for young children who clutter, very difficult to start to sleep. So what you can do, a little bit of sound, a little bit of light, and just give them time to relax, to be there. Don't push them to sleep or do nothing because that doesn't work. It is difficult for them to switch the button. Yeah, so that is something that you can do. Um, another thing is that these stupid lists that we know from, from, from history, we have to do this, 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 this. You know, the, the list before, make those lists, put them in the inside of the door of their room if they have trouble organizing. If they are already downstairs, forgetting that they had to brush their teeth or whatever, make a list and te help them to go step by step in order and, to- And, and I'm, not, um, I'm not familiar with, um, I'm not familiar with the list Simple concept. Is like you go up of, of, out of the bed, you take off your pajama, you- Oh, oh just, not, just, just like, a, like, like a list that describes the routine. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And only and then, the routine that a child has problems with, but write it down, put it on the inside of their room and make sure that you don't uh, take no for an answer. If this is the routine that you agreed on, this is how we have to do it. Yeah, so 
I don't say accept, accept the cluttering. No, 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 no. I can only help my kids, my friends who clutter if I, every time there's, an, uh, there's a time to do it, if I help them if, to correct it, if they want to be corrected at that time. Yeah, so um, make, make um, very good, smart uh, um, agreement on when you correct or when you don't correct. And my rule has always been, you can't correct more than three times a day or it will become irritating. So for, for the young children, I have these uh, magnetic um, things that you can put on the fridge and you have three of them. And if mom did, did make a correction, you, have, you can take one off. You can take one off, you can take one off, and now she can't correct anymore. But even if you only do it three times a day, um, then it can be of help. That can make them more aware of their um, sometimes unintelligible or un not understandable speech. So what else can mom do? Read, and if there's an error, Go, go back, go back. You have to do it again. I know it's painful, I know it's hurtful, but you have to do it again. And also praise, 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 and let them hear all the good moments. That is, that is very important. Um, so you can do, you can be tough in exercises as long as you also give the good good moments and if you praise those good moments and if you record them and if you show that to your family don't show a video in in which a person is not talking in an understandable way don't don't show that to family that's only shameful you can show it at home and say look what i heard is there something that we can do about it but never do that in the open and, and for people with cluttering, it, they experience it differently by person, by age. So make sure that you talk about it, that you have fun about it, that you um, can talk about the more difficult things about it because the children are sometimes bullied because of cluttering. If, if they talk in it in a more difficult way, there's always one guy behind them he is repeating them, or he would also do that, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, talk about it, talk about it, make it. And um, maybe the lesson for today: don't make it a, don't make it a problem. Find alternatives. Do you understand what I mean with that? Yeah, yeah, and that's um, so so. So with um, with me then well actually I think um, my my, uh, my mom said that she took me to a doctor and the doctor um, <clears throat> I think um, I think I um, I don't really remember um, the story but um, but the doctor misdiagnosed me with um, stuttering and 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 told my mom because uh, I think it was just like a family practice doctor and told my mom oh well actually don't um, don't focus on it too much because it'll just go away. And um, and and even though the um, even though um, even though like part of that is really bad advice um, because my cluttering actually um, well obviously didn't go away. Um, but but the part of um, the part of not making it a big deal. Um, so 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 the nice thing for me is that I don't have any like negative. Um, negative connotations about or, or negative negative stuff about my speech. Um, so um, so so I I'm not I, I I'm not like embarrassed about my speech or or I don't have those like like hurdles to go over um, because um, because my mom uh, because my mom just never like focused on it. Um, hope, um, hopefully, um, hopefully today like if 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 my mom if, um, if my mom um, or, or if 
if, if someone similar to my mom and some, someone similar to me um, is, is Googling now, they, um, they'd realize, oh, well, in addition to, um, in, in addition to not focusing like negatively on it, which is, which is the good thing that my mom did, there's a lot of stuff we can do to focus um, positively on it. And, and I really like what you said of, of like, like, like when you're showing videos of your child, then especially if you're working on their speech, then, then, uh, th th then, we, when, then when you're showing videos to grandma, don't show videos of, of them struggling with their speech, showing, show, show videos of them doing like really good, good things with their, with, with their speech. Um, because, um, um, because there's like, like with, ev with everyone, like no matter how disjointed your speech is, there's always, uh, like, like, even if you have to record for three hours, um, you, you can find like 10 seconds where the speech is good that you can show to grandma. Hey, look, um, look, Billy, Billy, um, Billy, B Billy read this book really good right here. Um, that's, um, you know, and, and even if you ask Billy to read the book for grandma, and you record that, he will do perfectly because he's focused. It's for grandma, you know? That's what he would like to do. He wants to make, he wants to read out loud the book for his little sister because, and he wants to do his best and it's perfect. Record it, show it to grandma. Yes. Yeah, so oh, yeah. and, and, and that's, a, uh, that's a great point about cluttering too, because with, um, with, with, uh, with cluttering, there's a lot of really, really good instances, um, along with a lot of really, really bad instances. So, so you don't, um, you, you don't really have to wait three hours to get a ten-second speech sample. Um, you, uh, um, you, um, you can just do a technique like you said of, hey, hey, now we're making a, now we're making a video for grandma, um, and then, and then speech is perfect. Yes, and and. Uh, I, th I think that's that's the uh, that's the essence. Understand that sometimes it's an issue. As a teacher, try to figure out why is it an issue instead of thinking, oh, I already know why. Uh, accept that handwriting can develop till 12, 13 years of age and sometimes even longer. And if a mom tells you that the child is smart and you don't see that in the school results, keep digging and take an expert to school. Keep digging because if a child is not recognized for his capabilities, that is hurtful for the child and he can be bothered by, him, by it uh, for long. So, and we, that's not what we want them to be. And I have not met people with cluttering um, that are ashamed of their speech. I have to correct you on this. And the reason why is they are not completely aware of what they are doing. But I have met a lot of people with cluttering who have fear for communication itself or fear to fulfill in a certain role because they have the, the idea that they are not taken for granted or they're not understood or whatever. So fear of speech, many, many cases, no. Shame of, no, no. It's more the being unaware, not understanding why other people respond to you the way they do. That is the most uh, important in cluttering. Uh, that makes sense. And, and um, one, um, one thing that I wanted to talk about before we wrap up the video that, you, that you'd mentioned before, is how how cluttering impacts friendships and relationships, um, especially in um, in children. Yeah, well, um, how many children in a classroom have an issue with speech condition? Not that many. That's one thing. Secondly, how many children in the classroom are very smart or very fast? N not that much. Um, how many children like to talk about all these complex issues that other uh, that other th kids are not even interested in, like um, plane crashes or um, elections of presidents or uh, environment or things like that? If, in a, if you go to a group of ten, nine or ten year olds. Many of the kids are not interested in that. So 
what I do see is that some of these children um, tend to be a little bit more alone. They don't have that many friends. Doesn't make them unhappy, but they don't have those friends in school. And then I hear a teacher say, um, but he doesn't make friends in the classroom. Well, that doesn't give him a social problem if he has the friendships outside of school. And if he has social relationship outside of school that are on his wants and needs, this kid does not have a social problem. And um, if you talk and the other kids don't understand you, they will try for two times, three times, four times. If, if you are not understood for five, six, seven times, they go to a different friend and they play with the other friend, yeah? So they give you, they, they, they turn your back on you. And that is understandable for those children, but it also makes the person who clatters alone. So if a child is very difficult to comprehend or to understand, it's a teacher's responsibility to clarify to the class that this is what is happening, that this kid has an issue here and how can we help you? How can we be of help? Then he can try to connect. And if he's not connecting, could be speech related or it could be related to his way of thinking and his interests. And that is also good. He doesn't need to have 10 friends in the classroom. If he has a good social network outside school, don't worry about him. He will, he will get there. Yeah, so there's two sides of, of the story. Help the kids who really need to, to be helped. Help them to understand, but he did not understand you. That's why he walked away. And then you can also in the classroom um, make an agreement. If you don't understand me, you just say this and then I will do it and say it in a different way. Yeah, so to, to clarify what is going wrong. But if it has nothing to do with speech, but with interest, like then many kids ask if this kid has a social network outside the school. If he has it, don't worry about him. I think that's the most important I would like to say about that. Okay. And and that's um, that's a really um, that's a really interesting um, technique of of having the teacher um, basically say, "Hey, well, um, this um, this this student you might not understand them at first, but here are some techniques that we can uh, that we can use and and ask ask them to um, explain it in a different way and that kind of thing. So so that's um, so so that's interesting. So um, so I, um, I remember as a kid being like wanting, wanting to connect with people more and wanting to have more friendships, but not, but, the, but there being like a, a barrier. Um, you, uh, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that from the, from the teacher's perspective, perspective, what the teacher can do, what, what, what can the parent, what can the parent do if they see their child um, that uh, um, like, um, like me when I was a kid, um, wanting, wanting to, to connect more, but, mm -hmm. but, um, but just kind of having some problems actually doing that. Well, if, if the child wants to connect and is not capable of it because of speech, I always practice um, to tell little stories, like two, three line stories, very short lines, so not too long. Short lines that you can be you, be, you can be more uh, intelligible if you have a short line. You know, a, an ape escaped from the zoo is more clear than, did, do you know that there was, that was an ape and he, did, well, no, different. I, that was too fast and not good. Did you know that there was a chimpanzee and he escaped in the zoo in Am Amersfoort and he killed them? And if you try to do that even faster, but I can't, sorry for that. But then this kid will be like, what? But if I introduce my story short, an ape ex um, escaped in the zoo, an ape escaped in the zoo, it's clear. Everyone understands it. It's like, what? 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 And then you have a connection. So teach the child to start with a short, understandable sentence and use that in contact. 
teach them to tell short, understandable stories and not start by all these repetition, etc. Because if you have to listen to all these repetitions, Joseph, to be honest, that's difficult. But when you approach someone and 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 you and you and you 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 give you give you give you give 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 you give all this information that is some children are some children are a little bit afraid of it. So teach your child how to start a conversation. Short sentence, short story, three lines, for maximum four to six words. That's it. So, so basically, um, kind of modeling how how you start how you start stories and um, and then practicing um, practicing telling um, one line stories or like introdu introducing a story by a very clear first line. Yeah, yeah, and teach them if you want to talk to some someone like I did, but you did not know this. If I address you, I always say Joseph, because then I have your attention. So teach the child to name the person. And then if you have uh, Peter and Peter says yes, only to start then and not to start talking while Peter is not even listening. That is that especially for children with cluttering. It's very difficult. There's an idea to tell it. No, Peter, yes, story. Peter, yes, story. And that's a um, that's a really good technique um, to um, to give you a few seconds to help formulate if you first um, if you first say the person's name. Yeah, it has to do with your formulation, but also with the processing of the other person because if he says yes he will look at you and he will focus on what you have to tell and then they can easily process it uh okay and and i should practice ivan so what you're saying is that if i say ivan then you're starting to listen to what i'm saying and then um i'm also i also have a little bit of formulation practice yeah, and, and that's um, that's something that you could do. Uh, that's something you do. You could model really well between parent and parent and child. Is is the mom always saying Peter, and the, and then Peter always saying mom, um, and 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 then you're both doing that um, together. Whether it's a yes in between, don't forget it. Peter, oh, oh. yes, story. Okay, so so I say Ivan. Yeah. Ivan. So I can do yes, or I can do this. It's also yes, but you didn't hear it. But so it, it is a response. So if you just say Peter and Peter is not responding, we're not starting. You call him again. Peter responds story. That's it. And, and even adults could use that technique way more. It's not only for children. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I um, I was thinking uh, I was thinking that that's a that's a good technique for me to use. But but actually, I um, so so I read a lot of books, um, and uh, like like one thing, especially Dale Carnegie says that you should always call people by name. But but I found that when I try that, then people say, Joseph, what's what's wrong? Why are you being so formal? Um, uh, you just called me by name. Um, so 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 I, I'm I, I'm not doing I'm not doing it exactly right. But um, but sometimes I try it. Well. If you took with two people, you don't have to do it, but you you check before you start talking if the other one is listening. And you know, I'm doing this. This is another way of saying Joseph. Yeah, just doing this is also take, getting your attention. If you're in a meeting with other people, you have to call them by the name if you want to interrupt. And um, if you do that, everyone is listening to you. First, you, you take the turn by calling the name, get a response, then if you have to turn, formulate what you want to share. And everyone is listening. And in young children, that is difficult because they feel like you're holding back, but you have to learn to stop 
and tell. Cool. Well, that's um, that's a great that's a great technique, and like you mentioned, not only for children but for me to figure out how to um, integrate. It's also for adults. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I think for today we we talked about enough. Uh, maybe we could um, um, have an ep another meeting talking about um, therapy, and with therapy I also mean self therapy. Okay. So yep. Um, you do yourself to improve your speech if you are a person with cluttering. Cool. And I think um, I think therapy would be uh, would be a great next topic because I think like a lot of um, a lot of people now uh, know about know about cluttering, but um, but but they're wondering, hey, should I go to should I go to speech therapy? Am I gonna am I gonna find a speech therapist that knows about cluttering and and that kind of thing? So. So, um, so that's a great um, next uh, next topic to go through all of that. We'll do that. I will be prepared. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much. This was um, this was great, and I really appreciate you doing this. Wonderful. Okay. Talk to you next week. Okay. Bye.